All right, let's get on with our sermon this morning, our message. Let's read from John 1, 1 to 14, one of the great Christmas passages. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of humanity. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. A man came, sent from God, his name was John. He came for a witness in order that he could testify about the light so that all would believe through him. That one was not the light but came in order that he could testify about the light. The true light that gives light to every person was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world came into being through him and the world did not recognize him. He came to his own things and his own people did not receive him. But as many as received him to those who believe in his name, He gave them authority to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of a husband, but of God. And the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. No one has seen God at any time. The one and only God, the one who is in the bosom of the Father, that one has made him known. So this is John 1, 1 to 14. And as I was here last week, I realized that the model of evangelism is God and Christmas. If we're gonna be good people of sharing the gospel, we're gonna emulate God who is the evangelist. It's his mission. You might have heard of the Latin phrase missio Dei, the mission of God. So how does God do evangelism? What we learn from Christmas. We all know that humankind needs a savior. Watch the news every night. It's tragic, isn't it? Think of those poor people killed because of that volcano, subject to death. Even natural disasters <coughs> are a consequence <coughs> excuse me, of human sin. So we live in a world of sin, carnage, death, destruction, suffering, pain, grief, and terror. These are things that we know. We are quite insulated in New Zealand, and we don't feel it as often, but it breaks in sometimes, like in the last week, or the Christchurch earthquake or the terrible attack on the mosque in Christchurch. It breaks in, but all of us know from our own families tragedies, like a good friend of mine, a lovely boy, who's got a terrible pee problem at the moment, and they're trying to save his life. He's attempted suicide twice. He's a young boy that was uh, very important in our family, uh, and uh, it's really, really tragic. So what does God do? He acts. The Old Testament story is God preparing the way, acting in history, calling a people, saving the world through Noah, calling Abraham and Sarah, (coughs) excuse me, forming the nation of Israel and then leaving Israel with a sense of anticipation that God is gonna act in an even more dynamic way and he's gonna bring salvation. None of those things brought salvation to the nations in the way that God had intended it to. But what happens at just the right time, and I talked about timing last week, and I wanna reiterate timing is everything in sharing the gospel. Think how long God was prepared to wait before his word was spoken into humankind in Jesus. Thousands of years, actually. I'm not suggesting you wait thousands of years, by the way. Uh, You might miss the boat. (coughs) Romans 5, 6, just the right time. While we, we were yet sinners, God, Christ died for the ungodly. When the fullness of time came, Galatians 4, God sent his son. When the fullness of time came, and this is the timing thing. That's why you don't just, evangelism isn't just giving this out to everyone you see, it's about when the moment is right. What else can we say about God's evangelism? Then he sent his son, and this is the idea of evangelism. If God is love, then Jesus is love, isn't he? He was sent by God. And there's a whole lot of passages about God sent his son to be the savior of the world, one John for. He became flesh. He became incarnate, enfleshed amongst us. He joined us in who we are. He became human, our God. So we now, he, he didn't just stand back. He didn't just wait for us to come to some realization that he exists. He reached out. And that's how challenges God's people. He tabernacled, the Greek says. It's really interesting. He tented amongst us So no longer is God found in a temple or a building or a tabernacle, he's found in us, his people. We are God's people on planet Earth, called by him to continue his mission. We're a mission people. 
It's great. You know, there's two sides to Christianity. One is our, our worship of God and our love of God. That's the great commandment. But to love others is our fundamental call. He grew up in our world as one of us. He became as us to reach us. And this is another principle of mission found in 1 Corinthians 9 where Paul says, I become all things to all people. When he's hanging out with Jews, he behaves as a Jew. When he's hanging out with Greeks, he behaves as a Greek. Not their sins, just their culture. He learns the art of relating to people who they are. And that's something you grow in over time if you practice that. And that, the art, that comes from listening and observing and just being a part of that. Not faking it, not being inauthentic, but just meeting people where they are. That's what our God did. And then it says in John 1.18 that no one has seen God, but God the one and only who was at the Father's side, or in Greek at his, at his bosom, made him known. In the Greek, the word is exegeted him to us. Now, those of you who have done a bit of theology know that exegesis is when you get a bit of Bible text and you explain it. You expound it. It's a technical term. So Jesus is a sermon from God explaining God. That's what I was saying before. We don't know God except what we know about him through Jesus who came amongst us. He showed us what God is like. Indeed, in John 14, 9, it says that to see Jesus is to see God. So that Jesus is the word of God. He is a sermon. And Christianity is not a religion. It's a faith of relationship with this Jesus. And then we embody that Jesus ourselves as he pours his spirit into our hearts and we go out. And if we're willing, if we're willing to submit to him, he shapes us to be people who take Jesus into the world in mission. And we all do it in our own way. What did Jesus do? He emptied himself. This is that picture of a uh, cup there, God pouring himself out for the world, literally spending his energy, flowing in the Holy Spirit in every situation, just pouring himself out in the service of humankind. How did he empty himself, taking on the form of a servant, becoming human, becoming obedient to the point of death and dying on a cross? He poured his, literally gave himself to the mission. I was thinking this morning as I drove in, there was a guy riding a bike, and I thought, oh, I'd love to be out bike riding today. That's where most of my uh, non-Christian friends are, they're all in, out bike riding. But I don't go on a Sunday, and I felt God say to me, don't worry, Mark, you can ride for all eternity when you get to the other side. And I thought, well, that's right. It's just delayed satisfaction, isn't it? But what a reward we've got coming. So we pour ourselves out, we use our lives for the glory of God. So Jesus poured himself out and God's power flowed out of him, restoring. One of the things Jesus never used was his power for his own gain. He wasn't about wealth, he wasn't about power, he wasn't about woman, he wasn't about those things. He used everything he had in the service of God and in the service of others. So the Pharisees come and say, show us a sign, Jesus. One of them after he had just fed 5,000 people, which is a bit ironic, isn't it? Show us a sign, Jesus. And Jesus says, no, nah, I'm not showing you a sign. And then he talked about the sign of Jonah, his resurrection. That'll be enough. But the point is that if, for those with eyes to see, Jesus was enough. And we're, we're to use our lives in the same way. He gave his son. This is the principle of giving. This is the Christmas principle. It is good to retain that as long as we don't allow it to get too consumeristic. Right? I like those. Uh, apparently a group of you had a meeting this week where you were stealing presents off each other. That's good stuff. Yeah, baby. Maybe that's not Christian, Christ, Christmas though. And that's actually the summons of Christianity. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, great German theologian, said when Christ calls a man or a woman, he bids them come and die. That doesn't mean to necessarily die as a martyr, but to give our lives in the service of God. We're not swept up just into salvation. We're swept up into a salvation that God wants everyone to experience. He rose from the dead, imparting new life and launching a new world. So what are we to do? We're to obviously to believe and to enjoy our relationship with God, but we're to join him in his mission. Each one of us as we are. <coughs> not trying to be me, me not trying to be you with who we're made to be. The brilliance of the apostle Paul is he recognizes unique giftedness in each person given by God. We find out who we are. Like my friend who set up a geeks group to share the gospel with computer lovers young kids and they come into this room they've, they bring their laptops or they've got computers there and they all do geek stuff together now I'm not going to do that because uh, I can't fix a computer but he does that and it's working, young kids are coming 
Kids that would not normally be found in a youth group, actually, because they feel a little bit overwhelmed by extroversion. So these are introverts. We're to emulate, we're to go, to be sent. We go into the mess of the world and be what they are amongst them. That's why it's so important for the church to remain connected. The the Christian vision is different from Judaism, which was separation from the world, because you might get contaminated. We want to contaminate the world with Jesus. We want to be out there. Now, obviously, if we are prone to a particular sin, we stay away. An alcoholic doesn't go to a pub. Most men don't go and witness to prostitutes, for example. So we're very sensible and we're wise, but generally speaking, we're unafraid. That's why Jesus was mates with sinners. He didn't mind. The holy man wasn't meant to be a mate with sinners, but Jesus said, they're my people. So the sinners are our people. And God wants to make them his people. Our mission then is love, service, humility, and self-emptying on behalf of the world as Jesus did. God's way of doing evangelism is our way of doing evangelism. We go out, we are sent, we send others, and we go and we be those people. That's why it's so cool that we're all gonna leave here today and we're not gonna sit around together for the whole week because we've all got jobs to do and we've got places to be. You don't have to go hunting for people to share Jesus with. Just notice the people around you. Ask the Lord to show you the, the open heart and share as led, wisely, at just the right time. Later in Philippians, after Philippians 2, Paul talks about himself as being poured out like a drink offering. Paul there is identifying with Jesus. That's what he's doing in his mission, pouring himself out as a sacrifice to God. By the way, that that service you do to God is a thrill to God. He's delighted as we make that effort to go out and we begin to respond. What do we do? We take attitudes of spirit fruit from Galatians 5, particularly love, the virtues of God. We can read those and we know those and many of us have memorized those. And the greatest of these is love, 1 Corinthians 13, 13. John 13, 34, 35. This is why your community, your home groups, your gatherings are so important. One thing I've loved about being amongst you is the the love that I feel. I know this is one of Uh, Terry's great themes. Uh, We talk on TV quite often. We usually end up talking about love, don't we, Terry? It's one of Terry's great themes. And make that the thing that stands out the most. Let's be Christians who aren't famous for yelling at the world to to change the way you live. We want to. And sometimes we'll make our point known. But to show them the love of God in our community. It's the church that's the evangelist more than the individual and drawing our friends into relationships that we're forming together. That's why clicky groups are never good in Christianity. They're always to be open to the world. By this, all people will know you're my disciples if you love one another. Doing good works. Galatians 2.10, that should say, but Galatians 6.10 is also good. Doing good to all people. God has prepared in advance uh, good works for us to do. We're to do good to all people, especially those who are brothers and sisters in the family of God. So we have a special love for each other that is like a family love. It's a brotherly, brotherly and sisterly love, but that love has to be open to the world, doing good works. Speech that imparts life. Remember last week I mentioned this. Let your speech always be with grace and seasoned with salt. Knowing in each situation how to speak to a person is one of the great arts. We, we, we become great conserva- con- conversationalists, good conservationists too. We wanna develop communities that have a missional DNA. I think this is the biggest problem for a New, the New Zealand Christianity is that we've become very inward looking, partly because we're afraid. And it's, we've, you know, we're, we're finding it hard to be a Christian in our community. But getting a missional attitude into our DNA that we keep reminding each other we're here for the world. Our DNA is being a people that attract people with unity and sincere love. Romans 12, 9, I've mentioned that. But also going and finding the lost sheep. Finding the people in our midst who have that special ability to share Christ and supporting them in that. Raising up evangelists, but also the rest of us getting in behind it. It's interesting, when you look at the Gospels, I'm writing a book about evangelism at the moment, or I'm writing a proposal for a book, It's really interesting, where did the crowds come from when Jesus had crowds? There's crowds everywhere, why were they there? Someone had told them. Someone had seen Jesus do something weird and wonderful and had gone off and said, mate, you gotta come and see this guy, he's good. I think he's the one. We'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Going and finding the lost sheep and the lost coins. 
So that's our challenge. Now I want to give you some examples from Scripture of people who did this. So we talked about John's gospel. God sends his son, his son steps into planet earth and is the evangelist par excellence that we look to. How did Jesus go about his mission? But we have others in the story of God who then took that on and they're all in John's gospel. First one, John the Baptist. So John has just had people come to him and say, John, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? They were expecting Elijah to come from Malachi 4. Are you the prophet? They were expecting a prophet from Deuteronomy 18. There were these expectations. Are you that guy? And he said, nah. I'm here to point to that guy, but I'm not that guy. And he frustrated the Jewish leaders. And then after this happens, it says, the next day he saw Jesus coming towards him. Now John was a prophet through whom God was speaking. He looked at Jesus and went, that's the one. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's a gospel message. That's a gospel message in that moment. A gospel message does not have to be the full download of something like this. It's the moment where we speak, with that conversational moment where we say something. It might be as simple as, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Then, a little bit later, the next day, John's standing with two of his disciples. We know them to be Andrew and the writer of the gospel, who we later find out is John from church history. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, look, behold, the Lamb of God. That's all it took for an open heart. And they went, okay. Very, very very, um, self-sacrificial of John. He lost two of his crack disciples. But he was prepared to give them up because he knew that Jesus was the one they should be following. Later on in John 3, he says, I must become lesser, he must become greater. That's the task of every Christian, to make Jesus great, or make Jesus as great as he already is, if that's possible, if you get my drift. So they heard him and they followed Jesus. And from that point on, James, uh, sorry, John and Andrew are disciples of Jesus. What happens then? Well, one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, notice the word first, that's excellent. First thing he did, he found his brother Simon and he said to him, we've found the Messiah. There it is, gospel message. It doesn't unpack a whole lot of detail about Christ died on the cross and all that stuff, which is really cool. Not that it's happened yet. He doesn't even, he could go through the whole Old Testament and start pulling out all the texts that are written in Isaiah and Micah and and the Old Testament. But he says, we've found the Messiah, the one we've been longing for. And he brought him to Jesus. That's what it means to share the gospel. It's his brother. Most people who become Christians become Christians through a family member or a friend or an acquaintance. So if you're gonna be an effective sharer of your faith, it's gonna be those people. Because 90% of people who come to the Lord are like that. There's another 10% who just find, God finds them or they find God. But 90%, there's always a story behind a conversion of people involved. And by the way, it takes a band of jazz evangelists to save people. There are other people in their lives that are sharing the faith with, to, to them as well. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. There was what they learned as a child at Sunday school or at Bible and schools or something. There's a whole lot of other stuff. There's music that they've heard. Our job is just to be in that moment. He was in that moment. We found the Messiah. He knew, Peter knew who the Messiah was and he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and changed him forever. Simon, the son of John, you will be called Cephas, which means Peter, the rock. So this is what we're doing. It doesn't say then much else about what they did. Andrew didn't then say, well, I better go and get uh, Matilda and Tabitha. And we don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But what we find here is that he went and found him. I had this experience when I became a Christian. This has got nothing to do with me, except that I had the boldness to say something to my mate. We were runners, his name is Mike. And um, I finally in my 20s yielded to God completely and become a disciple of Jesus, having been led to Christ initially in, as a teenager in Rarotonga, which I've shared with you. So I yielded to God and we went for this run and as we we're running I says, oh, you wouldn't believe what's happened to me and I just told him I'd become a Christian. And uh, Mike just listened. He went off to his place. Next, a couple of days later, he said, we went for a run again. So we're running along, he says, I did it last night. I looked at him and thought, that could mean anything. 
Uh, I said, what do you mean? He said, I asked Jesus into my life last night. I said, what? So we stopped on the side of the road and it was just the most beautiful moment of my life because I thought, wow, one of them. So anyway, I thought, well, everyone I know is gonna become a Christian then. So I started sharing my faith and that was kind of it for a long time. <laughs> but he, he just, the Lord opened his heart like Lydia's like in Acts 16, like a, like a flower to be honest. And, he became, and he's still a Christian, he's married, he's got three Christian kids and he goes to a church out in East Auckland. He's a, he's a wonderful fella. Okay, Philip and Nathaniel. So then Jesus becomes the evangelist and he goes and gets Philip and Philip becomes a Christian. See how the Christian story's growing? This is how Christianity works, it's contagious in the positive sense of the word. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and he said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So now there's three of them. Philip found Nathaniel. So Philip gets found by Jesus, says, whoa, I've got to tell my mate. So he goes and finds Nathaniel and said, we've found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So you've got a lovely crisp summary of the gospel there as well. Again, notice it's different. By the way, there are no two evangelistic messages in the New Testament that are the same. They are all different. The speeches and acts are all different. Every encounter between Jesus is different and a person. Sometimes you say, go and show it to the priest. That doesn't sound like evangelism to me, but he had already healed the guy. So Jesus, they were listening, they were responding in the moment. This is our challenge. Then Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Auckland? I mean, Nazareth. Philip said to him, come and see. Come and see. What a brilliant message. What, did it, what we have in the last one, he brought him to Jesus. Behold, look, and now we have come and see, come and taste. Come and see whether I'm right. And then what happens is Jesus sees Nathanael coming towards him. He says, behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathanael says, how do you know me? And that's what happens when people come to Jesus. They find that he knows them. And that's the really cool thing. Not that we know God, but that he knows us. So this is how evangelism works. Now, I couldn't leave you girls out of the story. Evangelism is not a boy's job. Okay, they can have their arguments about female pastors and elders. Everyone, go away and have that later. But in evangelism, the New Testament is, a, is very clear. There were women evangelizing. I'm writing a book on woman and Paul's mission. There's at least 18 that I've found and more who are active in evangelism. Because God knows that there are equal numbers of women, actually slightly more than men. And for woman to reach woman is gonna require a lot of women, particularly in the ancient world where you've got women and men, very separate lives. In fact, for a man to wander up to a woman in public and say, how's it going, Doris? Dangerous. She'd have a minder who would step up and go, who are you, son? It's a, da a different world. But it's still the same principle. I think women tend to meet, re reach women and men tend to reach men because that's where our, our fundamental relationships are often found. Okay, so we come to the Samaritan woman. Now this is the most surprising story in John's Gospel about evangelism, because this is the first mass evangelist in John's Gospel. It's a woman. And she's not a good woman, she's one of the bad girls of the Bible. She's a Samaritan, which is despised. She's marginalized from her town because she's at the well at midday, not at the morning and the night with the other woman, she's alone. She could be soliciting. There are some scholars who think she's looking to pick up men there. Because later on it says she's had five husbands, but actually the Greek word doesn't say that, she's had five men, which could be husbands. So she could just be a young woman who makes her living from prostitution, it's possible. But either way, she's not a good woman because she's an adulteress. She's had a sequence of marriages or relationships with men. So she's a bad girl of the Bible, right? So Jesus asks her for a drink and they have that really interesting conversation which is a really good study in how to do evangelism as Jesus talks about water and the water of life. He takes what's happening in that moment and he talks about it. Then the disciples come back and she's a bit terrified so the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? There it is, the gospel. All we're doing is telling people about Jesus. We're pointing them. For them, they were looking and waiting for someone to come into their world. Come, see a man. Notice it's see again. This, we're inviting people to see. And we're inviting them into our community to experience. We're inviting them to read the scriptures with us. We're inviting them to experience a relationship with us. What happens? 
Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Wow. He told me all that I ever did. That was her gospel message. Can this man be the Christ? He told me everything I ever did. Now, this leads the Samaritans then to become evangelists. So they go out and they say, come and stay with us. Stays two days. And many more believe. You see how it flows. This is the story of the gospel that began with Jesus, sent by evangelist God, his son into the world, into the mess of human life and saying, go and be my word to the world. And we're to watch and observe Jesus and we thank God we've got the scriptures, which is our gospel in many ways as well. And we experience Jesus. We have our own story of coming and seeing. Why are you all here? Many of you know Jesus. If you don't, it's simple. Just say, yes, I wanna be your son. I wanna be your daughter. It's that simple. Don't have to do anything. Doesn't have to be any sort of giving of anything in any particular way. But what then happens is that you live for him. And you don't keep it quiet to yourself. You go and live for him. All right, so we've had the four examples. So let me just bring it all together to wrap up the series. First of all, how does, so this is how evangelism works, through sending. And we are sent to do what Jesus did. In John 20, 21, Jesus breathed on them, the Holy Spirit, and said, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. Plural, that's us, we're all going. We are sent to the world to give ourselves for it, and his life is our life pattern. We're to be like Jesus. We're to pray for workers. We need more workers. This church needs more workers. For mission effectiveness, to share the gospel boldly with clarity and God's power to be seen. We've mentioned that in the last weeks. We don't need to go over that again. To trust him because his gospel is powerful. When we say a word like come and see, that is infused with God's power. And God then summons that person. They might go, I don't want that. But that's their call. To trust him as we do, his gospel is the power of salvation. To be motivated and shaped by love as we serve. For Christ's love compels us. I mentioned that last week. To be and to act and to speak as God's people full of love and conviction. New Zealanders admire conviction if it comes with love. Be those people. To be witnesses. To know the music of the gospel and to play it by ear. And that's why we keep immersing ourselves in the Christian story. To learn it from different angles so we can share it in different creative ways. We know that some will receive and believe it because there's people like my friend Mike. They're out there, but we just don't know where they are. We don't know who amongst all those friends that we've got are the ones whose hearts will open and flower. We know many will reject it. The parable of the sower tells us that. There's only one group that received Jesus and become fruitful out of the four groups. In 2 Timothy, Paul talks about Preach the word in season and out of season. So there's a seasonal dimension. We don't worry what season it is. We preach the word, as he says in that passage. It's God who opens ears and we're called to invite them. We know we will suffer and be despised. We expect that. What that tends to do is make us retreat. Rather, what we should do is be what Paul says in Philippians 1, do not be intimidated by those who oppose you. Continue to contend for the gospel, but in a gracious, loving way. And it means blessing when we're persecuted. They praise God that you're you're persecuted. We don't go looking for it though. That would be silly. We respond with prayer, blessing, and love and not curse when it happens. We receive our reward. This is how God's saving and restoring his world. The church dies and stagnates when we stop sharing. That's basically it. And when we stop loving each other and then taking it to the world, the church just begins to die. I'm part of the Presbyterian church. I can promise you that. Don't follow our example. So the question for you is, will you in your own way with all that you are and have, with all your fears and trepidations and concerns and bad experiences in the past, with all your brokenness and weakness and harm and pain that's been done to you, will you join him? I feel like in a sermon like this, I'm God inviting you but I'm not, I'm in God, I'm his messenger and I'm just inviting you. I know your, your pastors, your leaders yearn to have a church that just sees people coming to Christ. People healed and restored. People's lives transformed. This is a little church. By the way, it's bigger than Jesus had when he died. Only 120 even after he had risen from the dead. But the Holy Spirit can do anything. The Holy Spirit can do amazing things. And we know he wants to because he loves Kiwis just as much as he loves anyone else. 
He possibly loves them more, eh? Because we're God's own, right? No, he loves everyone the same. He wants them to reach. So let us go, let us join God's mission in a fresh way. Not that we're not, but let's just realize our responsibility that we're disciples and our primary role in the world is to make disciples. We baptize them, we teach them, and then it passes on. Some of us need to make new non-Christian relationships again because we've run into that phase of life where we just live our lives and we're too busy. Well, let's think about how we can rearrange our lives so we've got those connections. You know, you don't have to tell people about the gospel, you just gotta give them a good book and there's lots of them out there. I'm not the only one who's written a good book. There's piles of them out there. There's a thousand ways we can share our faith. Will we go and join God in his mission?